Hey, everybody. Pastor Matt here. Um, I wanted to get this out to you last week, but I don't know what ended up happening. I used Zoom to uh, to record this, and it went all the way up to 99%, and it would just never go over the goal line and get to 100%. So I wanted to get this last portion about uh, out about our uh, Christian ethic in regards to war, and we had already covered two of the aspects of it, which was pacifism and preventative slash crusade. But now I want to make sure that we're getting to this last part. So I want to take about 10 minutes. That's what I'm hoping this will be to take about 10 minutes to be able to talk about the last one. And I think it's the one that's the most influential for a lot of us. And that is what's called the just war theory. So let's get this up here. And so this is part of our always ready study that we're doing at Arapaho Road Baptist Church. And I, if you're looking for a church, I'd love to have you um, come join us and talk to us. If you have any questions for us, please let us know. But you can look us up at arbc.net. We're in the process of updating our website. And so most everything that you'll see there is completely up to date, but it's probably going to take a couple of weeks to make sure that everything is humming the way that we want it to, that will be of best use for you. But we, we are at 780 East Arapaho Road in Centennial. And I hope that you'll, you'll come join us. We have our small groups at nine o'clock on Sunday mornings and then our worship service at 1031. I have people ask me every so often, why 1031? Well, it's because one, it makes you ask that extra question. And it reminds you and reminds us of 1 Corinthians 1031, that whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, you do to the glory of God. And so we're a Colorado Baptist church that meets in South Denver. Love to have you come by. But this is a study that we're doing on Wednesday nights. It's called Always Ready. And it's taken from a passage in 1 Peter 3, 15, to be always ready to make a defense for the hope that you have, but with gentleness and respect. So the idea behind this is to not only know what we believe, but also to engage in what others believe about certain things. And with gentleness and respect, engage those ideas. And hopefully it will help strengthen us in what, what God is saying. And it may help to sharpen those areas that may not be um, what, what lines up with scripture. And so here, what we're going to be talking about, let's go ahead and get rolling on this, is that we're going to be talking about just war theory. Let me, let me make sure I'm not covering any words here. So just ad bellum. So the idea of what war, how we engage and look at war, going toward war. That's what this is talking about. So this criteria, criteria helps us to determine whether it is just to engage in warfare uh, against an enemy. Now, this is very similar to the others. Is, there, is it just to do so? Now, with pacifism, pacifism would say, no, there is no just reason to engage in war. And they give biblical reasons, and I encourage you to go back and look at the previous video that talks about that. But there are those that realize and recognize, from, not only from the reading of Scripture, but from common sense, that there may be times when you do have to take up arms and go and do this. So, we're going to go through some, some rationales behind this, and hopefully we'll be able to engage into some scripture. Now, some of these scriptures that I'm giving you are from, or would be able to clearly show the rationale behind it, and some of it is a stretch. And I just got to say this, um, a, a lot of the material um, what I was able to get from Ken Magnuson's class, a class that he taught at Southern Seminary, Seminary on introduction to Christian ethics. So what's talked about here is that is there a just cause where, where it's self-defense, defensive neighbor, protection of life, restoring justice and peace. Isaiah 56 in verse 1, well, listen to what this says, and you can determine whether this is a viable passage to give a rationale for just cause. Keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come, and my righteousness be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who holds it fast. 
Then you look at Psalm 82. Let me pop back over here in Psalm 82, not too far forward. And Psalm 82, verses 3 and 4, say this. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy and deliver them from the hand of the wicked. So this first passage, I think it's a little bit of a stretch, but it's the idea of being able to be an instrument of justice that God gives on the earth to be able to help those who are weak or defenseless. You're able to come along and to, and to do that. Give justice to the weak, the fatherless, to maintain the right of the afflicted, the destitute, to rescue the weak and the needy, to deliver them from the hand of the wicked. So there will be aspects of just cause that will say, look, I'm seeing someone that is being harmed. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you may see someone that is a fellow image bearer of God that is struggling, and that you can see why a nation would go and come along and help. So you have to make sure that this is, a, this is truly following the parameters of just cause. Well, let's go on and talk about just intention, which means to secure the causes mentioned under the just cause aspect without causing harm. Now here, Romans 12, 13, and 14, the, the, that's the passage in the part of Romans that really begins to dig into what application looks like as far as the doctrines that were outlined in the first 11 chapters. Um, in verse 19, it says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Verse 21 do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This passage, again, here is talking about making sure that you are not causing harm, that you are not taking something out of God's hands that should be firmly placed in his hands. And then you look at verse 14 or verse 19 of chapter 14. It says, so let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. So if, if you're able to do something that causes the least amount of harm, or if you can do this and engage in this without causing harm to the citizenry, that is absolutely ideal. And I think some of these following aspects of this will be able to make this a little more clear. Uh, last resort, um, all attempts at peaceful resolutions have been made. This is where I personally, me, Matt Perry, this is where I think that pacifism may come up short. Because pacifism, I believe, is right in doing everything that you can diplomatically to make sure that you are able to broker a peace. But what happens if that's not the case? And all of those things don't work. Just war theory says, last resort, you exhaust, like a pacifist would say, you exhaust every possible option and attempt for a peaceful resolution. And if that's not the case, and you see the great harm could be done by this unjust warfare that's going to be engaged upon toward you, then you end up getting into it. Then you end up taking up arms and making sure that you are operating in a just way. Um, competent authority, when we talk about that, we're talking about that. We're not talking about like neighborhoods and, and households and, and tribes. What we're talking about here is a competent governmental authority, and this is where it can get interesting. Governments serve as the only body that can wage war. That's what the just war theory says. But what does this say about terrorists? Terrorists aren't governments, although if you watch the West Wing and you watch and, and you hear others is that these terrorist organizations are really their own walking government. Do you go after them? because they may be doing this, even though they may not be part of a nation, they are certainly a group that is causing harm in an, in an orderly and organized way. What about revolutionaries? I know that's been a conversation as far as we who were colonists, did we have a way and a rationale to go against King George III, right? And so Romans 13, one talks about shouldn't have closed it, but Romans 13, 1, really, I'm, I'm so grateful that the Holy Spirit led the, uh, the apostles to address some of these issues because it gives us some significant guidance. Romans 13, verse 1, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there's 
no authority except from God and those that exist that have been instituted by God. Because these people have been put in place to provide protection for the citizenry that is there, They're not left wide open. They have been given a task and a role to be able to handle this and to protect the citizenry. Now, here's the thing is where, where some would look at it is like, does that mean even with Hitler? Is that mean even with Stalin, Mussolini, Putin? Does that mean that this is the same deal? And I think that the answer to that would be we must obey God rather than men. If there is clearly an, an unjust aspect of where your own citizenry is being harmed by the, well, by the dictatorship and brutality of their own leader, well, we must obey God rather than men. Acts 5.29. You see how this can go in a lot of different directions. Proportionate objectives. Um, in other words, the cure must not be worse than the disease. The desired result must not be worse than the concern. In other words, if someone comes at you, the, the analogy could be if someone comes at you with a pea shooter, you don't come back with them with a howitzer. Proportional objectives. We've got to keep that in mind. Probability of success. Is it just to engage in a war where the, pro is it just, I always read that wrong. Is it just to engage in a war where the probab probability of success is low? And the idea would be no. And that's where in Luke 14, 31 and 32, Jesus says a king's not going to go out into battle. If he has 10,000, they have 20,000. He's going to count the cost. He's going to try and broker a peace. And that's what we see here, the probability of success, because now you're putting your own army and your own citizens into harm's way. That was talking about how you approach war. This is talking about conduct in war. And I just want to list these off here because some of these overlap, but I know if there's questions, I would love to be able to, to address these. Uh, principle of proportionality, the use of force is limited to what is necessary. The principle of discrimination, the use of discrimination and tactics in regards to whom they will attack. In other words, you're going to go after the army. You're not going to go after the citizenry. Now, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Vladimir Putin, his army, hit somewhere in Ukraine that was very clearly marked as for children. Now, we do know in terrorists, when, when you know terrorist activities, and sometimes we see that sometimes bombs are being carried by pregnant women, that sometimes um, terrorist outfits can be meeting in nurseries or hospitals. And so the wisdom that's needed and the protection and the intelligence that's needed needs to be really clear according to just war theory. Number three, a prohibition of abuses of war, good faith. Um, you must keep treaties. Other activities like raping women, massacres, desecration of holy places or monuments, biological warfare, terrorism, that's right out. We don't, we don't do that. We still see those who are enemies of us, not simply politically, but as image bearers of God. Just war theory especially as St. Augustine, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but this goes all the way back to Socrates. But Augustine was the one that put the Christian understanding from scripture to this as best as he could. There's, there's holes, as we've talked about. Number four, success. If it cannot be obtained, withdraw. If it cannot be obtained, withdraw. So as you know, this is a very deep and a very complex issue. So what does that do for us? I didn't. I chose not to add this as a slide, but for us as believers, this means that we have to make sure we are truly praying for our leaders and the leaders all over the world that they are following through in significant wisdom. Because if they're not, then they're just going to go and do whatever they want and do whatever comes across them. We need to pray that God gives them wisdom to move forward and they see that they need to be pursuing God and the wisdom that he gives moving forward. Are you praying for your leaders as 1 Timothy 2, 13 to 17 says, as 1 Peter talks about? We have got to be praying for our leaders. And we're not simply praying for our leaders that we consider our president, right? Whoever president we have, that's our president, right? You may not have voted for him. You may not like him, but he's your president. And Romans 13, 1 says that God has put them there for that reason. And so we need to support them. We need to pray for them. Yes, communicate with them areas that you may have a problem with 
or you see as a significant issue, but we, we still got to make sure that we're praying for, for, not a, for our presidents when it comes to stuff like this. What questions do you have? I hope that we can continue to have discussions like this because we desperately need to make sure that we're always ready to make a defense for the hope that we have, but with gentleness and respect. My name is Matthew Perry, and I hope to help continue to um, connect you with uh, truth and hope that you can find in Jesus. God bless you all. Bye-bye.